Gentlemen, uh, thank you. Thank you very much for coming. I'm delighted to have you here. It's as a we usually only get audiences of this size when we get Bill Gates and Bono, you know. I mean, these are, so we clearly have a rock star. Uh, delighted to have you here. I'm sorry, can the microphone, are we okay? I'm delighted you're all here. My name is John Hamry. I'm the president here at CSIS. Uh, would like to welcome uh, His Royal Highness Prince Turkey Al Faisal. Uh, he has been a participant in a number of things that we've had a privilege to work with through the past <coughs> years. And I also want to thank Tony Cordesman for his close working ties with uh, His Royal Highness and helping to facilitate today. Um, you know, history is often the product of great forces that, that uh, move through countries and through regions, but sometimes history is genuinely made by single individuals. Uh, I think that uh, uh, Prince Turkey has been one of those individuals that during the last three and four years has been crucial in shaping a history, especially as it relates between our two countries. Uh, we've had uh, close ties for 50 years, and we've had some awkward moments over the last five. And it's taken someone of genuine stature and depth and sympathy and understanding on both sides to help uh, work through a lot of those issues. Uh, this comes to uh, Prince Turkey through deep experience here in this country. He is been a frequent uh, visitor to this country, was a student in this country, a graduate student in this country, and is now back representing the uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia at a very crucial time when both our countries are rethinking uh, our postures in the world and our relations with each other. This calls for a, an unusual intellect and uh, a, a a perceptive and wise leader, and I think we have that in, in uh, Ambassador uh, Turkey Al Faisal. I'm delighted he's here today. I know that uh, you can see the moment and the importance of the issues before us by the number of people that want to hear you today. So we're delighted you're here, and without no further delay, let me turn to you and let me introduce to you His Royal Highness Prince Turkey Al Faisal, the Ambassador from Saudi Arabia. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أفضل المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Hamra, thank you very much for those kind words that you introduced me with. I hope I live up to the expectations. The, uh, this is the first time that I will speak at CSIS, and CSIS is an incomparable institution worldwide. It proposes ideas and programs, but I think more importantly, it promotes common sense. And I must tell you a secret. I spend most of my time here in Washington trying to catch up reading Dr. Anthony Korsman's prodigious <laughs> products for their uh, tremendous uh, erudition and clarity. And I'm very grateful to him and others who have been very helpful to me in not only informing me and educating me about your country, but also about international affairs. Uh, recently, ladies and gentlemen, I was reminded of a story about Mark Twain, who attended an event in which one of the speakers was raising money. Uh, Twain, deeming the cause to be a worthy one, decided to donate $100. And as the speaker droned on, however, Twain decided to cut his contribution in half. With no end in sight, Twain cut his offer again at to $10. And at last, the speaker finished, and the collection basket was passed around. Twain reached in the basket, removed the dollar, and passed it along. <laughs> I hope I don't have the same impact on you, but I'm not looking for a collection. Therefore, I will be sure to make my remarks short and allow for your questions. Today, I was asked to discuss the road ahead for Saudi-U.S. relations. I would say that if this question were posed to me five years ago, or even three years ago, I would have a very different answer. But I say to you that today, as a result of serious work on both sides, there are a lot of positive things to say. 
Right now, on an official level, relations between our two countries are stronger than they have ever been. Indeed, the terrorists miscalculated in their attempts to drive our nations apart. They only stirred a resolve that has resulted in greater cooperation and coordination between us. This has come to extend far beyond the war on terror. Most importantly, the U.S. and Saudi Arabia have even come to recognize that our enduring relations are bound by much more than oil. We have a number of important pillars that support our relationship, and I will name six of them. Oil, trade, the war on terrorism, Middle East stability, military cooperation, and the mutual fondness that we have for each other. These pillars form our foundation. They define our interaction and provide us with concrete reasons why our nations continue to work together successfully. But where do we go from here? How do we continue to improve our relationship? There are still many issues left unresolved. There are still sticking points. To address the challenges before us and the challenges ahead, the first thing we have done is to put in place stronger links between our two governments and an institutional framework to better manage the, ma and the many complex issues we have on our common agenda. The clearest example of how this is taking shape <coughs> is the Saudi-U.S. strategic dialogue. This new mechanism is intended to institutionalize relations between our countries to overcome inevitable differences and to align our resources and capabilities to a greater extent. The strategic dialogue is progressing through regular meetings between the Saudi Foreign Minister and the U.S. Secretary of State. And the establishment of working groups from both governments to work constructively and comprehensively on a continuous basis in a range of issues of importance to both countries. The first meeting occurred during King Abdullah's visit with President Bush last year in Crawford. And since then, Foreign Minister Saud al-Faisal and, Sec and Secretary of State Rice have met twice for the strategic dialogue. The gatherings are open to candid discussion in a collegial atmosphere. There are also meetings of the six working groups, which include energy, economic and financial affairs, consular affairs, Partnership, Education, Exchange, and Human Resources, that's one committee, Military Affairs, and Counterterrorism. I shall tell you now how the strategic dialogue works. In the beginning of May, President Bush invited me to a Getting to Know You meeting at the White House. During a thorough review of issues, I made the point to the President that solving the Palestinian problem will allow us to go on to solve the other problems in the area. Three weeks later, the meeting of the strategic dialogue took place. Prince Saud delivered to the President a letter from King Abdullah, offering to work with the President in solving the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. The President then instructed Secretary Rice to follow up with Prince Saud on the details. Alas, the capture of the two Israeli soldiers led to the Israeli invasion and destruction of Lebanon. The king sent Prince Saud back in July to stress to the president the need for an immediate ceasefire, and again to press for a solution to the Israeli-Palestinian problem. Prince Bandar bin Sultan and Adil Jaber accompanied Prince Saud, and in August they came back to Washington to follow up on these issues. The present activity we see in the Middle East is a direct result of these joint efforts. The next meeting of the strategic dialogue will take place in Riyadh in December. Another step we are taking to improve relations is to increase our people-to-people -people contact. The Kingdom is encouraging more delegation of officials and business leaders and citizens to come to the United States to share their views and to learn in kind. We have also expanded a scholarship program to send our students to college abroad. 
Many of our students will be coming to the United States. More than 10,000 are already studying here. They will not only be receiving a world-class education, they will be forming the next generation of friendships and bonds between Saudis and Americans. They will be the true ambassadors. And yet another thing we can do is develop better relations between Saudi Arabia and the U.S. Congress. <coughs> this is a priority for, for us. My colleagues and I have been meeting with members of Congress. We have been working to answer them th their concerns and questions about the kingdom and express to them our concerns and our questions about how we view our relationship with the United States. There are a lot of issues on this level as your representatives in both houses of Congress are some of our toughest critics. But as the saying goes, it takes two to tango. There are also things that the U.S. needs to do, such as facilitating visas for Saudi citizens, encouraging U.S. trade delegations to visit the kingdom, and promoting dialogue between intellectuals in both countries. For a country of such critical importance to America, regional and global affairs, we encourage American representatives to come to the kingdom. We want them to see our country. We want them to meet our businessmen. We want them to hear from our citizens, our men, our women, and our children. I am confident that if they come to the kingdom, their outlook will change for the positive. This brings me to my last observation on how we can improve our relationship in the future. I think the type of discourse between the United States and Saudi Arabia needs to change. We don't mind being criticized. There is a well-known saying in Arabic, your true friend is one who tells you the truth rather than one who simply agrees with you. But it is the way in which Americans criticize, whether it is politicians or public figures or thought leaders, that causes us concern. We often hear political rhetoric and bombast and not constructive commentary. Americans want to see and hear about reform and change in Saudi society and political culture. That is on the agenda, ladies and gentlemen. But we're not going to change just because you tell us to. We are changing and reforming our society because it is the right thing to do for our people and our country. And we will do so in our own way, in accordance with our traditions and culture. Making dictums leads nowhere. Constructive comments, on the other hand, are more helpful. We also want to see reform in the United States. Your reform of campaign contributions is essential and needed yesterday, not tomorrow. Your policy towards the Arab world must change and be reformed in order to overcome the slump in America's standing in my country and in every other Arab and Muslim country. Why not productively engage us instead of engaging in rhetoric that seems designed to drive us apart? Currently, we find the analysis of Saudi Arabia lacking. It does not have a clear and real understanding of what is going on in the kingdom and appears to be emotionally driven. It needs to be less revealing of political agenda and more of good sense and plain dealing. That would be helpful to both sides. Your opinions, your thoughts, and your analyses are not just considered by Americans. They are considered by Saudis, too. And if we want to improve the state of our relations, it would behoove us to improve every level of our communications. Our interests are too intertwined. If you look at the problems we're facing today, the war on terrorism, Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, Palestine, Israel, Lebanon, energy, the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, 
None of these problems can be faced alone. We must work together to find solutions to these challenges. Our relationship today, ladies and gentlemen, has matured. It was tested by the tragic events of 9-11 and emerged stronger than before. Officials in both countries recognize the need to put in place institutional frameworks to further solidify the relationship. This effort, I am pleased to report, is proceeding very well. And I am confident that the future of our relationship will be, God willing, a bright one. I hope this has provided you with an idea where the Saudi-U.S. relationship is heading. And I now look forward to hearing your perspective and would be glad to answer any questions. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Your Highness. I think that it is a tribute to you when we look around to see how many people are here today and how much interest there is in U.S. and Saudi relations. But since my job is to be a filter, let me also ask all of you to look around and see how many people there are. And as a result, I would ask the following favors of you, that you ask one question that it does end with a question mark, or at least a simple <laughs> statement, that you wait for the microphone, and that you identify yourself before you ask the question. And with that brief set of, I won't call them rules, but guidelines, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Arno? Prince Turkey, thank you for that most illuminating presentation, I simply wanted to ask you what you feel would be the wisest course to cope with the Iranian crisis. Saudi Arabia talks to Iran frequently and frankly, and we exchange views with them on every issue that can come about to, of interest to both our countries. We've talked about nuclear proliferation, we've talked about influence and interference in Iraq, we've talked about Hezbollah, we've talked about Gulf security, everything that you can think of, we've talked about. And we hope that by talking to them, that we'll be able to at least open their eyes to what concerns us in the area about the possibilities that may arise from whatever action they may take. And I think for the United States not to talk to Iran is a mistake. Uh, we've found in our experience that when we did not talk to Iran, our relations were, were broken for a period of a few years in the, in the 90s, we had more troubles with each other. But since then, our relationship has improved dramatically and <coughs> beneficially for both our countries. So we think that negotiation and talking to people is more important than shutting the doors on them. Thank you very much. Uh, let's see. Ian back there. And again, may I ask the lady, please, if you could move the mic. And please do identify yourself. Thank you, Your Excellency, for your comments. My name is Pauline Shams, and I'm with Freedom House. I wanted to um, thank you for bringing up the issue of reform, and I would like to applaud Saudi Arabia on its efforts to um, work towards greater press freedom. Um, That's a welcome development. And, <laughs> and also, um, we've seen some openings in the kingdom for, uh, in, with regards to women's freedom. So um, I guess as a human rights organization, we are – in Washington, D.C., and in terms of other human rights organizations around the world that are concerned um, for the situation in Saudi Arabia, we would like to ask you, um, we understand your statements today referred to the, the idea that dictums are not useful. So what would be your suggestions for how we would communicate these? I know Freedom House has put out several reports, um, including, you know, 
on a yearly basis, we list Saudi Arabia, unfortunately, as one of the countries that are the worst of the worst in civil and human uh, um, political liberties. So please. what would be your suggestion? Thank well, you. We've made uh, contact with, with your organization, and uh, we've had meetings with them, and we are developing a relationship of dialogue uh, with, uh, with Freedom House and other organizations that either knock on our doors or on whose doors we knock. Uh, in our country, we have uh, um, helped establish a government uh, organization that deals with human rights, and uh, it is now being uh, constructed and, and developed, and hopefully uh, sooner rather than later, Will, uh, will engage with, uh, with uh, other human rights organizations that are officially based. In, in my country also, a group of citizens have, uh, have established a human rights organization, um, and uh, hopefully it will, uh, it will engage with uh, those uh, human rights organizations that are based more on, on private and, and civil and, and uh, uh, non-governmental uh, groups, and it is only through talk and dialogue, I believe, that all of us can, uh, can benefit. We never claimed in Saudi Arabia to have either developed the most perfect society or to have established the most perfect political system, and uh, particularly in the last 15 years or so, we've been open to learning from others of their experiences. And in the establishment of whether it is our Majlis Shura, which is the uh, the uh, the uh, parliament that uh, that we have established, or other uh, political institutions, including the municipal elections that we held last year, we invited non-Saudis, whether from government or private uh, non-governmental organizations, to come and talk to us and. and help us and guide us in how we can go forward on, on these issues. We have our doors wide open, and we don't mind criticism, as I said. And uh, Freedom House and others that uh, would like to engage with us, we're more than ready to do that. Let's see. Oh, that's second row. Martin Walker, UPI. Um, one of the features of the, um, of the hostilities in Iraq has been the outbreak of sectarian violence between Shia and, and Sunni. Prince, Jordan of, uh, Prince Abdullah of Jordan has uh, talked of the emergence of a, of a Shia crescent, and uh, President Mubarak of Egypt has suggested that, uh, in his view, uh, many Shia owe their uh, loyalties to Iran rather more than to their native countries. Could you give us your view of, uh, of, of King Abdullah's remarks and his concerns about the Shia Crescent? And could you also say whether um, President Mubarak's remarks about Shia loyalties in any way could be said to refer to the Shiite minorities of Saudi Arabia? I thought I may have heard that question from you on, on the McLaughlin report, but not in this uh, setting. Um, the, the kingdom does not believe that the citizens, whether they're Shia or Sunni of Saudi Arabia, owe their allegiance to anybody else, hopefully, but for their own country. And uh, in, in Iraq, as you mentioned, the sectarian uh, problem is, is increasing. But I'm of the view that there will not be a sectarian civil war in Iraq for a simple fact. And that is most of Iraq, not only in the, in the Arab side of Iraq, but also in, in, in the north, uh, where majority Kurds live, um, the, uh, the links and the interlinks between Shia and Sunnah uh, go beyond uh, the, uh, the capability of anybody to, to drive them apart tribal confederations and, and family, uh, families are uh, divided between Sunnah and Shia. You find a, a man who is a Sunni may be married to a woman who is a Shia, and their children will be divided between Sunnah and Shia, and, and the reverse is true. 
and and those who who think that uh, that sectarian uh, conflict in Iraq, I think, uh, will will lead to uh, to civil war or the breakdown in Iraq. Take that into consideration, because breaking down Iraq is not going to be easy. How are you going to do it? Or if you are going to do it on sectarian terms, then in the south of Iraq, there are more than 30 percent uh, Iraqis who are not Shia. In, in the center of Iraq, in Baghdad itself, there is a majority Shia uh, population. In, in the north, there are Shias and Sunnis. It's going to be practically impossible to divide Iraq in, in, in sectors and because that will entail literally not just mass immigration and, and, and uh, ethnic and sectarian cleansing, but a lot of killing and between families and, and tribal uh, uh, groupings. So I'm not of the view that there is going to be a sectarian civil war in, in, in Iraq. And I think that will be uh, something that we will have to wait and see about. Now, as far as King Abdullah's views on, uh, on, uh, on the Shia, Crescent, as, as, as he called it, well, they are his views. Uh, they are not the views of, of King Abdullah of, of Saudi Arabia. And when I tell you that we talk to, to the Iranians uh, on, on issues uh, of mutual uh, importance, so one of those issues is uh, Iranian uh, uh, activity in, in places like Iraq and uh, and more recently in their links with, uh, with Hezbollah. And uh, as you know, uh, the Organization of Islamic Countries, or Islamic Conference, uh, has invited uh, Iraqi Shia and, and Sunni religious leaders to come to Mecca in Saudi Arabia for a conference on how best to, to meet this challenge that is uh, facing both the Sunni and the Shia in, uh, in Iraq. And uh, uh, consequently, uh, the kingdom is hosting that, uh, that conference and, and supporting it. Now, we have uh, a significant minority of Shia in, in our country. And historically, um, they, have, uh, they have suffered in, in the kingdom. Uh, they have suffered from, from social and, uh, and uh, even political uh, uh, alienation and and discrimination, but that has been recognized by, by the leadership. And King Abdullah, even before he became king, has um, extended his his, uh, his his hands to them uh, and brought them in more into the fold. And uh, hopefully, uh, such uh, uh, an effort will uh, will uh, will continue. It may take some time, but things like that generally do. And uh, I am reminded as, uh, as, uh, as a student here 40 years ago uh, that it was in the middle of the, of the civil rights movement here, uh, at which time uh, people of, of, uh, of color, not just blacks, but all colors, were striving for achievement of equal rights in, in America, and this was nearly 200 years after the Constitution was was established in America. So issues of, of social uh, discrimination and social problems take their time. But I think the problem in the kingdom has been recognized and there are efforts to, uh, to resolve it. So, um, the lady in the third row. Uh, my name is Nadia Belbesi with Al Arabiya Television. Um, as you know, Secretary Rice is in the region. She's meeting today with uh, President Abu Mazen. Um, many, not many people expect anything going to come out of this visit, and many actually think it's a token to win uh, the support of so-called moderate Arab states on the Iran file. Do you agree with this analysis, and do you honestly believe that this administration is uh, serious about solving the Israeli-Palestinian question, considering what's happening in Iraq, Iran and election in two years. Thank you. As I said in my, in my talk, we've been talking with this administration more recently since uh, a few months, but even going back to the first year of the administration, 
If you remember, in, in, in August uh, 2001, uh, then Crown Prince Abdullah sent a letter to President Bush uh, in which he said that uh, our two countries are coming to a crossroads. Uh, we can either uh, go forward together or let us decide now uh, how to, uh, to, go, uh, to go forward separately. Uh, and the main issue then was, was the Middle East uh, problem, and at that time, uh, uh, then Crown Prince Abdullah's view that uh, America, and pr particularly President Bush, was not doing enough for the Middle East uh, problem. And since that time, of course, uh, September 11th uh, came up uh, soon after that and uh, derailed some of the efforts that, that were being made to, to bring um, – more American involvement in the Middle East. But uh, recently, as, as you've seen President Bush talking at the United Nations, the major portion of his speech was about the Middle East. He talked about Iraq, about Iran, about terrorism, about uh, Palestine, and uh, he, in that speech, he commissioned Secretary Rice uh, to, uh, to take over, or, or rather to continue to promote uh, whatever ideas may come about to resolving the issues in, in the area. And we think this effort of Ms. Rice now in, in, in her visit to the kingdom and then to Cairo and now to the Israel and, the, and, uh, and Palestine uh, is in that framework. Uh, and uh, we live in hope. Uh, I think the basic uh, uh, fault in, in, in international uh, diplomacy towards the Middle East in the past 50 years has been lack of implementation. We've had uh, um, ideas and, and proposals and, and uh, initiatives uh, um, for 50 years without any concrete uh, uh, implementation. The most recent, of course, being the, the roadmap and, and the Abdullah peace plan. And we think that this may be a time for, for the United States uh, to put its foot forward and, and, and do what it has been talking about within the framework of, uh, of the roadmap. And we remind our American friends that sometimes in, in, in smaller countries, including Saudi Arabia, in order to, to meet the, uh, the challenges that may arise to a leadership within that country, that leadership may once in a while turn to these opponents or critics of, of its policies and, and say, we're being pushed by this huge bear behind us, and, and we have to, to accommodate uh, the, this, uh, this push. And America has not been playing that role uh, for the past few years. So this is what we've been talking with the administration about, and hopefully Secretary Rice's visit will move the United States more in that direction. Uh, there's a gentleman who's been patient standing on the side there. Thank you. Um, Ian Talley, Dow Jones Newswires. Uh, the first pillar of um, importance with relationship between the uh, U.S. and Saudi that you mentioned is oil. Um, and uh, Saudi has traditionally shown its leadership uh, in uh, the OPEC. Uh, um, <laughs> Given that uh, Venezuela and Nigeria have been cutting oil uh, and calling for cuts on the past few days, um, uh, does this uh, call into question of uh, OPEC, uh, OPEC's reliability as a supplier uh, and Saudi's leadership uh, in, of OPEC? You know, that question has been asked since 1969 or 70 when, when OPEC has, uh, came about. And every year there is a perennial uh, questioning about OPEC's reliability and Saudi Arabia's leadership. We don't look upon that issue as, as, as one of a contest for leadership uh, between Saudi Arabia and Venezuela and Nigeria or other, uh, other countries. OPEC, in my view, has been a very successful grouping of countries that have come about, first of all, to protect their interests, but also generally has followed policies that also serve the international uh, world's uh, interests uh, in the issue of oil production and oil pricing. And uh, 
if you remember, since 2002, and perhaps even, even a year before that, OPEC has, has, has met frequently and, and set uh, price ranges uh, for, uh, for oil. Now, 2006, those price ranges of the uh, uh, energy forum in, uh, in, uh, in Riyadh, uh, which uh, has within its framework uh, about 90 countries that uh, deal with, uh, with energy, and, uh, but also not just governments, but uh, oil companies and other uh, institutions. And I see many people here from the oil industry who can perhaps better answer that, that question than, than I. But, but it is no good to think simply of, of OPEC by itself. You have to think of OPEC, and there are other players outside OPEC who produce a lot of oil, uh, like Russia and Norway and, and so on. And uh, they, ha they have been invited with OPEC in the past and will continue to be invited to look upon this issue as a global issue and not simply one of Saudi Arabia, Venezuela, Nigeria vis-a-vis -vis the United States or other uh, oil, uh, oil consumers. So OPEC will continue on its course and hopefully um, be helpful in, uh, in promoting uh, policies that are mutually beneficial for the producers and the consumers. And Saudi Arabia, for ever since it was a member of OPEC, has always had in its mind not just the big consumers, like the United States or China now and India and Europe and so on, but equally importantly, if not more importantly, the poorer countries who cannot afford the high prices and whom we and others from OPEC and outside OPEC have had to come to their help uh, in, in meeting some of the um, challenges of the price rises in the past. These are the countries that are, that are most affected when the price of oil goes up to $70 an hour, uh, $70 a barrel. So it is our concern as well in trying to bring down the prices to a reasonable level uh, to meet, uh, to allow these countries to meet the challenges of these, uh, of these issues. The lady in the front row. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador Elise Labitt with CNN. Um, if I could take you back to the Israeli-Palestinian issue and- Do we have to? <laughs> <laughs> Um, you talked about the U.S. and its lack of implementation or enthusiasm over, over the last several years, and, and this trip by Secretary Rice could signify um, a greater engagement. But we also see, um, as my colleague pointed out, um, efforts by Secretary Rice and, and this administration to bring in, in an even greater way the Arab states and, and this new block of GCC countries and, and Egypt and Jordan um, do you think this, this signifies a recognition by the United States that perhaps even more so in the wake of the war with Lebanon that it has lost its dominance as the sole peacemaker in the Middle East uh, peace process? And do you see a greater role for countries like yourself and Arab states, although they've played a, a consultative role, but a, but a greater mediating role um, on these issues, not just the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but, but some of these other issues going forward? Do you see this block as, as um, something that will have a, a greater um, weight? Thank you. Well, as I said in my talk, um, the, uh, 
our view is that there should be reform of U.S. policy towards the Middle East. Uh, and this is in light of the fact that all of us must recognize that the U.S. standing in, in public opinion in our part of the world is at its lowest ever. And therefore, something must be done to, uh, to reverse that, uh, uh, that uh, issue. And uh, in our view, the only way you can do that is by solving the problems. And the core problem in the Middle East for the last 50 years has been the, uh, the Palestinian-Israeli dispute. And you, you solve that problem, and then you can go on and solve other problems in, uh, in the area. The, the GCC plus two, as it's been called in the press, is not a bloc. Um, it, it's, it's a combination of countries that have similar concerns and whose engagement with the United States has been both beneficial and productive over the years. And therefore, it, it was convenient since the President designated Secretary Rice to be his, his, his lead man, if you like, between quotation marks, uh, in, in the area uh, that she should meet with these, uh, with these countries uh, in that effort. And they talked about all the issues uh, uh, that, face, uh, that face us in, uh, in the Middle East. And hopefully something concrete will come out of it. But talk is not enough. Um, something um, concrete. And, and our foreign minister yesterday had a press conference with your Secretary of State in Jeddah, in, in which he said that the efforts must now concentrate on, on, on achieving results rather than talking about procedure. Uh, we've talked about procedure for, for 50 years. Uh, now we have to tackle the, the hard issues of not the, the Palestinian problem and hopefully resolve it and then go on to solve the, the other problems. So this is what we are looking for from the Secretary's visit. Uh, let's see, the lady in the front row. Thank you, Your Majesty, for being here today. Well, thank you for the, for the promotion. <laughs> Lauren Sellers, you and I see. Uh, one of the biggest bones of contention in the Middle East is the United States' special relationship with the State of Israel. Would it be possible to improve U.S. standing in the area without compromising that relationship? I think any friend of Israel, particularly the United States, would do Israel a world of good if it convinced it to enter into peace process with the Palestinians. And something that will inevitably bring an end to all of the things that all of us face in the Middle East, whether it is terrorism, whether it is land grabbing, whether it is targeted killings, whether it is demolition of homes and uprooting of, of of citizens on both sides. So um, we see no problem in the United States having a special relationship with Israel. Rather, we hope that because of that special relationship that America can do something about, about convincing Israel to come forward and be more, um, how shall I put it, more contributive to the, uh, to the peace efforts. So I'm going to find it difficult to place, but uh, the gentleman, yes. Yes. Mr. Ambassador, as you know, in the wake of Hamas's victory, the quartet, that's the United States, European Union, Russia, UN, put forward three set of criteria for, um, the, for talking to Hamas. And I was wondering, A, does Saudi Arabia subscribe to the international community, the, to the quartet's view on these three criteria? Can you, can you say here that you endorse them? A single question has one part. <laughs> do you endorse it, and would you update the Saudi peace plan, as the rumors are saying that you might be in thinking about? Thank you. Well, first of all, let me say about the peace plan. There is no need to update it because it's been updated every year at every Arab summit conference since it was proposed in 2002. And the last conference in Khartoum reiterated that, uh, that proposal and at the United Nations uh, recently all the foreign ministers that represented the Arab countries um, mentioned the fact that the, the Arab peace plan is, is on the table. And uh, hopefully we can get something moving about that. 
Hamas is, is uh, and, and the election of, of Hamas in, uh, to the government in, in, in Israel and the condition in, in Palestine and the conditions that have been placed on it are an international uh, issue. And there is a mechanism now that was devised by the uh, European Union to get support and aid to the Palestinian people that <laughs> precludes any possibility of any of that financing or aid going to uh, terrorist activity uh, in uh, either the territories or in the area there. And we subscribe to that mechanism. And uh, as Prince Saud said yesterday as well in his press, co press conference, unfortunately the mechanism is not yet uh, working efficiently because there are still monies available to go to the Palestinian people that are still in the banks in, in, in Arab countries uh, because of the inability to get that money across through that mechanism to, to its intended uh, recipients uh, in, uh, in the West Bank and Gaza that need a great deal of, of, uh, of support. So the kingdom is part and parcel of the international uh, uh, effort not to punish the Palestinian people because they elected Hamas. Um, this is a specific irony here, I think, for all of us, that when people exercise their, their democratic uh, rights uh, as advised and, and besieged and sometimes even militarily invaded <laughs> by, by uh, the United States, uh, that they get a sense, the people finally, that, that they're being punished for making a choice that does not suit others. Okay. Uh, in the middle of... Hey, Heinz, I'm uh, Raphael Danziger from APAC, and my question is a follow-up to a question I asked you at the Brooklyn Institution a few months ago. At that time, uh, you stated that uh, while Saudi Arabia has lifted the secondary and tertiary boycott of Israel, it's still maintaining the primary boycott of Israel. And since that meeting, you met with the U.S. Uh, trade representative, and you pledged to her that Saudi Arabia from now on is going to uh, honor all of its commitments under the World Trade Organization. May I ask how you found that out? Do yep. you have any spies with her? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> and my uh, question is, uh, since you pledged to her that from now on Saudi Arabia is going to honor its commitments under the World Trade Organization rules and extend uh, most favored nation treatment to all the members, including Israel, Raphael, has Saudi Arabia now lifted the, the uh, primary speech. boycott of Israel? Is that, that's the question. Well, we're dealing with the trade representatives directly with that. Um, yes, uh, the gentleman over here. Uh, look, I'm so, sorry, let me, okay. Uh, what I do want are questions, not follow-ups. Well, this is asking a question again that hasn't been answered. I'm Barry Schwad of Associated Press. The question was, isn't, the issue isn't so much how do you get aid to the Palestinian people who are in terrible economic shape. The question is, does Saudi Arabia support the U.S. prerequisites for negotiations? that Hamas recognize Israel and disavow violence. Do you, does, 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 the, does the kingdom support that, or perhaps you consider it an artificial mechanism for avoiding uh, really pulling for, pushing for negotiation? When Hamas was elected a few months ago, uh, a month after that, or a couple of weeks after that, uh, King Abdullah visited uh, many countries in, in Asia, and the last visit was in, in Pakistan, in which uh, a joint communique came out with, uh, with President Musharraf, in which both leaders called for the Palestinian leadership in general to adhere to the uh, commitments of the Palestinian Authority and the roadmap and the Abdullah peace plan. And as such, Hamas obviously was the intended uh, recipient of that, of that call, uh, that in our view, Hamas must recognize uh, the commitments of the PA and the roadmap and the, uh, the Abdullah Peace Initiative uh, as a priori to any further, uh, further steps that may be taken with Hamas. Let me, ladies and gentlemen, I'm 
look at all the questions. I apologize for the fact I've had to make choices somewhat at random. And I think we've reached the point where we are on the edge of the last question. But uh, let me go to the back of the middle and uh, ask that gentleman there. Thank you. Jeff Lightfoot from the Scowcroft Group. What is the state of security of oil fields in Saudi Arabia from terrorist attack? And what is the kingdom doing to ensure their security? We are doing whatever is necessary to, to ensure the security of the oil installations. And uh, as you know, last February, I think it was, uh, there was an attack at one of the, our oil facilities in, in the eastern province. Uh, and uh, subsequent to that, of course, uh, there was a, a review of all of the, uh, the steps that had been in, in place beforehand to see if they could be improved. And we've had not only um, our own experts looking at that, but we've invited expertise from, uh, from other countries to come and advise us if, if there are any new things that, uh, that we can do. Uh, oil is the basic lifeline for Saudi Arabia. And if we were not able to secure the oil installations, uh, we would not be able to secure our lifeline. And hence, uh, the priority we give to, to that issue is, uh, is A1 in American terms. So um, it is uh, an issue that we take very seriously and uh, much, uh, much spending has, uh, has occurred in, in providing uh, the know-how and the skills and the training uh, for our people to protect the oil wells. Ladies and gentlemen, I think it's a real tribute to Prince Turkey that so many of you come today. I apologize that we cannot cover the entire Middle East, nor that we really do not have time to deal with all of the questions involved. But, uh, John, do you want to offer an official note of thanks? And, uh, I, I, I would like to thank uh, His Royal Highness. And uh, uh, this is the holy month of Ramadan. He has now started the beginning of a very long day without food or water. And I'm going to let him get out of here. And you've all been very kind. Thank you. Let's